This is joint work with Eric French and uh, John Jones. Um, and it's about Medicaid insurance in old age. It's uh, related to what uh, Andy has been talking. Um, so let me uh, start from a common ground here. Um, what, is, uh, what are the public health insurance programs for the elderly in the United States? As you all know, Medicare is a large program that is open to pretty much everyone in the United States, and it's not based on income or asset tests. And uh, it is for a lot of medical services, uh, but a very important component it doesn't pay for is typically nursing homes. Or, as Andrew was saying, when you have an activity of daily living impairment, you might end up in a nursing home or in other kind of situations, but uh, when, whenever this happens, it's really expensive. So um, that's where Medicaid, Medicaid comes in. Um, it's a mean-tested health insurance program, so it's based on your income and your wealth. But, um, it, so, but it assists the poor and the impoverished, and it's becoming a really large program. To give you an idea, um, it covers about 70% of nursing home residents in the United States now. Right? So that's just a gigantic amount, and as Andrew was saying, uh, this nursing home or uh, long-term care arrangements are incredibly, incredibly expensive. So it's practically the largest risk you're going to face in retirement. So with this kind of Medicaid coverage is a really big deal. And to connect with uh, what Daga Elmendorf was they saying the other night, well, you know, we have costs rising on all sides. Either we raise taxes or we cut benefits or both. And uh, the goal of our paper is really understand what Medicaid does. There is a lot of work on Social Security. There is a lot of work on Medicare. There isn't a lot of work on Medicaid. So let me tell you what the questions are and why we think they are important. So Medicaid was designed to insure the poorest against medical expenses. Um, but you know, one thing we might want to know is who benefits from Medicaid. Is it really the poor, or is it, you know, there is a discussion of Medicaid also benefiting uh, middle and higher income people. Life expectancy is climbing. As, as you live more years when you're very old, you might face very expensive medical conditions, even if you had a very good job, okay? So the first thing I'm going to show you is we are going to look at the data, and, you know, surprisingly, if we think we are the first ones to document this, who gets these Medicaid payments and how much do they get? The, so we, we are going to use data for the first bullet point, but the second question is, well, if I spend a, a dollar on Andrew, uh, how much does Andrew value this insurance? Um, and you know, it's, uh, it could go either way, because if Andrew has a strong preference for liquidity today, or doesn't have a large risk aversion, doesn't care against future risk, might value the dollar of insurance less than cost. Right. Conversely, if he's very risk averse and this tail risk is very hard to insure with savings, he might value it 10 times. So we just don't know. So that's what we need the model for. The model is going to match a set of important data and take into account the dynamics that I might be healthy today, but I might be very sick when I'm 95. So you need to take into account all of the dynamics to make this insurance a value kind of statement. So we are going to discuss how big this valuation for high income versus low income people and you know, I think I'm going, I hope to be able to sell you on something that you might think is a very counterintuitive result at first. And then once I try to explain it, you think, well, you know, that makes sense. Um, you know, in a very limited sense, because I'm going to focus on the elderly today, I'm going to be able to tell you, for those who already retire today, is it about the right size? Of course, I'm not going to tell you about people who are young and might make saving decisions because they would save differently if the rules were changed, okay? Um, also, there is an efficiency argument that I was trying to explain with this dollar cost and the benefit of the dollar spent, but there is a redistribution. We all know that if Andrew uh, is going to benefit, it's not clear that he pays the full cost because that is a redistributive. So I want to make clear one thing. Uh, Andrew gave a gr great presentation. Um, his uh, data set is about well-off people. Here, we are considering DHRS data. And in one sense, it's a representative data set, but we focus on singles. OK? 
Okay. Why do we focus on singles? Well, you know, you don't want to see the model in 15 minutes. It's really hard to think about the couples. That's another work that we are doing. But, you know, the singles are those that are most likely to end up on Medicaid and for which the value of this program is largest. And in any case, you know, after age 70, 50% of people are single and 70% of households are single. So it's not a small fraction of the population. Um, so when I, I, I cannot show you all of the data I would like to show you. When I uh, tell you top income quintile, I want you to remember that this is someone who is a single retired person in the US. You should think their um, uh, income, non-asset income, is about $25,000 a year. So this is what a rich person is. And typically has, I think, about 600000 uh, in assets when they start retirement. So that's what a rich person people is going to mean here, right? As opposed to the Vanguard data set. Um, I think I need to be particularly careful of the, with presenting after you. So let's um, start talking about uh, giving some answers because we don't really have a lot of time to spare. Who gets Medicaid? I'm going to show you first rates, how many people get on Medicaid and how much they get. So when you talk, look at the bottom income quintile, the bottom 20 percentile of income, it's flat. Whether you look at age 74 or 95, even 98, about 60 to 70 percent of people are on Medicaid, right? I find it actually interesting that it doesn't climb higher with age, and I want to understand more how, you know, sicker people die. So it might be that they are just a much healthier group of survivors. But I think it's interesting. It doesn't really climb much uh, at the bottom income quintile as people get really old. If you look at the top income quintile, the program is doing its work in the sense that at age 74, only 2 to 3% of people are on Medicaid. However, you know, once they get to age 95, it's 10% for the top income quintile, right? $25,000 a year income, $600,000 median assets when they started, they are not exactly poor, okay? Um, so why do I think it's an interesting question? Well, why do I, you know, why am I talking about the distribution? Well, uh, as it has been studied for social security, people who are richer, they live longer. And if you live longer, you might be exposed to medical conditions that are chronic and much more expensive. So although Medicaid is designed for the poor, it might be that the rich are getting quite a lot out of the program, okay? In addition, there are two important ways to qualify for Medicaid. In the first one, you have low income and low assets. You have been lifelong poor, okay? So, but the second one, you don't start poor, but you, since the thresholds are net of your medical expenses, you know, I'm not saying that anyone on the room is very likely to end up on it, but it is conceivable that a single person with initially high social security payments gets wiped out by these very expensive um, medical needs. Uh, you know, $85,000 a year in a shared room, it's a lot of money. Think about a five-year stay, that's really impoverishing, right? So there are these two reasons why even higher income people might benefit from, from Medicaid. So let me show you a second set of data. So here, again, you have households classified according to their income quintile from the poorest 20% to the top 20%. And here you see average Medicaid payment. These are data from the Medicare Current Beneficiary Survey. So you see that the person uh, age 74 expect, uh, gets about $9,000 and with the 70% recipiency rate. So if you divide and you only consider the payment per beneficiary, something very interesting starts to emerge. And actually, what you can see is that while the recipiency rate decreases monotonically with income, conditional on receiving Medicaid, the payment is increasing, right? What is this telling you? This is telling you that these uh, people who have higher income are more likely to live longer and to have a long nursing home stay that is very expensive, right? So you can start seeing why this is an insurance product, this Medicaid mean tested, that pays with low probability, but in a really catastrophic state of the world. Remember that these payments are tied to being sick, okay? So if you receive this much money, it means that you are sick, 
Okay? So you can see that this kind of insurance program, pro, uh, product that pays with a small probability but in a very painful state of the world might be very valuable from the standpoint of insurance. Okay? So I'm not spending a lot of time on the model. Um, I'm modeling people who are retired. I want to focus on savings and uh, medical needs risk and who are single. The model is... Uh, particularly difficult to deal with because I want them to be able to choose how much to spend in regular goods, but also in medical goods and services. A traditional thing that people working in this area do is have medical goods and services, uh, having the medical needs be a shock that just hits your resources. So you cannot really adjust them, but you might think that if someone is getting impoverished, might take measures to reduce the medical goods and services, so you would be overstating the value of Medicaid if they couldn't adjust, okay? We are going to assume that once you are 70 and you have eaten a dessert every day and a lot of butter and never exercising, your life expectancy is pretty much given, and what you buy is really the quality of care. Like, like Andrew. And there are other papers that say that about 20% of medical expenditure is life-saving, but the rest is really about having uh, someone smiling rather than being stuck in a bed. Okay? And I think Andrew made a very nice case about how you can buy a continuum of goods and so on and so forth. Um, so there is a nice model. Uh, we spent years and years in estimating it. Fits uh, as well as a structural model can, uh, people face health shocks. Okay? They can be in good health, bad health. Nursing home is very similar to needing uh, activity of daily living, or they can be dead. We want to allow, like Andrew, for a lot of heterogeneity, okay? because uh, women live longer than men, richer people live longer than poorer people, and if you don't take this into account, you cannot talk about redistribution. Okay? So people will uh, differ in their uh, life expectancy and their medical risk depending on gender, permanent income, age, and past health. Okay? Um, medical shocks, medical needs shocks, can be transitory, I break a bone and next period I'm fine, or can be Alzheimer, and so they can be very persistent. We allow for both uh, medical shocks. Um, we are going to, med uh, to model Medicare, okay, because it's an important part as a copay. Okay. Um, we are going to model Medicaid fairly rigorously. I cannot tell you in four, four minutes and 26 seconds. Uh, the richness of the model requires you to think seriously how you should ma model Medicaid. So basically, we assume Medicaid provides you a floor of how unhappy you are. You're not under a bridge. You're in a Medicaid nursing home. That's one way to think about it. Okay. So. Once we do all of our machinery, we have, a, we have seen data, and now we have a model that we want to use to determine how much people value this public insurance program. Okay? So what we do is we reduce the generosity, think we cut Medicaid transfers by 10%, or we increase them by 10%, and we see how much would I save for a given person? How much would they need to be compensated? So it's a cost and benefit analysis from the standpoint of the cost of the program and the insurance value that you attribute to this kind of insurance at the margin. Okay? So this again, uh, I have a permanent income quintiles. If I cut Medicaid by 10%, for example, pick someone at the bottom 20 percentile of income, you save $4,500, okay? But how much do people value those cut? Well, they want 63,000, okay? In this table, I take the ratio, okay? So this tells me that someone at the bottom income quintile values every dollar of insurance at 1.4, okay? Interestingly, as you climb up and you go to higher income people, the valuation increases, right? Why is that? Well, it's really because of the catastrophic insurance aspect. You know, the people at the bottom income, they don't have a lot of uh, consumption risk. They are always there. But people who are at the top income quintile, in the sense I try to make very clear, they have a small probability of living to age 98 and needing a nursing home for four years, right? So that's a really unlikely but really expensive utility cost, 
right? So the, th uh, the first provocative interesting result from the model is, well, actually, middle to upper income people might value Medicaid more. So we need to think about what this program is doing. And uh, in this sense of the current retirees, nobody wants a cut in terms of if they pay one for one, okay? If we increase it, well, it's interesting. I can do the increased cost. I can see how much money I could take out. Interestingly, for about 60% of the people, it's less. Don't, they don't want an expansion, okay? It's, at least it's not efficient from an insurance standpoint. They value an expansion at less than cost, except for these people, it's really hard to insure against a tail risk if you don't have an insurance product and you just need to save. I'm keeping all of this money to save for an event that is very unlikely and that's expensive, okay? However, this is not how taxes work. So we also went to the PSID and we uh, made our best guess to compute how much people pay Medicaid taxes depending on their income. So for instance, if someone is at the bottom income quintile, they pay 20 cents on the dollar, while if they are at the top income quintile, you pay five dollars of Medicaid for every dollar of benefit, right? So in an insurance sense, the top people would want more Medicaid, but not when they have to pay it at this rate, okay? So in this sense, the, the Medicaid size for the current retirees is about right. There is that insurance efficiency aspect, and then there is the redistribution aspect, okay? So let me conclude in the last 30 seconds. Uh, High-income people do receive significant Medicaid transfers with low probability, but when that event happens, those transfers are large. And uh, these, they value these transfers a lot. There is risk aversion and there is tail risk of these very painful states in utility terms. And in this sense, Medicaid provides valuable insurance to higher income people in the sense I've tried to clarify. And its size is right for people who are retired today. Of course, if you tell today people that you will change benefits 20 years from now, they would save differently. So I cannot extend the conclusion to everyone.